In the borderlands of Britain, during and before the early 1600s, violence was perceived to be an appropriate way to respond to wrongdoings. Celtic culture, wherever it has been found, has been regarded as violent. The author Grady McQueenie says, Proud and contentious Scots, Irish, Welsh, and other Celtic people were ever ready for mass combat or individual duel. Dr. Samuel Johnson, an 18th century chronicler of the Scottish Highlands and its people, described public processions there, whether solemn or festive, as occasions for local lads to do battle. Thomas Crofton Crocker, who conducted research on Ireland during the early 1800s, described the Irish people as being wild and unruly, barbarous and warlike. King James VI, who authorized the translation of the Bible into English, offered similar description of his ancient people. With the American South attracting so many folk of Celtic extraction, is there evidence of the persistence of informal justice in the United States? Today on The Vantage Point, we're going to take a closer look at some data in real-world cases and informal justice in Appalachia. As we'll see, the Hatfield and McCoy families in Kentucky didn't have a monopoly on personal and clan retribution. I hope you'll join me. Differences in violent crime rates in America's states and regions illustrate the method of solving problems with acts of personal or clan justice. To put things into context, the national homicide rate in 2017 was 5.3. According to the FBI, Massachusetts, Minnesota, New Jersey had murder rates of 2.5, 2.0, and 3.6. Iowa and North Dakota had murder rates of 3.3 and 1.3. At the same time, southern Appalachian states and Arkansas averaged 7.1, or higher violent crimes in the Upland South, a reflection of the Celts' way of exacting justice in the manner that had served their ancestors in their homelands? Interestingly, many scholars have chosen not to consider this explanation to account for the regional differences in violent crime rates in the United States. Instead, they argue that social and economic inequalities explain the high incidence of violent crime. In that model, poverty causes people to become frustrated due to relative deprivation. That's a group's affluence as compared to others. Being frustrated, they act violently. If this argument were valid, poor hilltop towns in New England would also experience high homicide rates, but they don't. Other factors must contribute to the violent tendencies inherent in the culture of the South and the Upland South in particular. Some social scholars have argued that ethnic diversity in urban areas results in violent crime. Many Appalachian and Ozark towns and cities, despite a lack of ethnic diversity, have homicide rates that are higher than their northern counterparts. When we exclude economic, racial, and population density as factors contributing to the high incidence of murders, we are left with cultural explanations. I contend that the South's larger rates are suggestive of a culture prone to use violence to solve problems. More evidence of the cultural connection to violence comes from Sandy Gap, North Carolina, the mountain community that I have discussed in other videos on Appalachia, like superstitions, ghosts, and premonitions. In Sandy Gap, the Johnson, Walker, and Voiles families have experienced Celtic justice in painful ways. Vernedith Voiles relates an incident that occurred in 1917, and I quote, They was having a meeting over at the old Baker house when 17-year-old Dolly Voiles was killed. Pastor Stiles was a preaching, I believe, and Dolly seemed to be in the spirit when the worshippers heard a commotion outside where some of the men folk was talking. Before long, the Johnsons and the Foles men were fighting and getting pretty loud. Somebody said that a Johnson boy who was a scuffling with Everett Voles come around from behind the makeshift church and pleaded with his daddy for help because he'd been cut. The old man Johnson looked at the boy's wound and said, that he'd been hurt worse than that in the briar patch." End of quote. In a similar way, the folks in the house were getting pretty upset, and I quote, Dolly stood up with a trance-like look on her face. I reckon she was feeling the spirit. She stood up and looked at the ceiling with her arms open wide and said aloud, your guns and your knives won't hurt me. End of quote. When she said that, a baker man stood up and, and hollered, well, We'll see about that. He reached in his pocket, pulled out a little gun, and aimed it at Dolly. He shot her before anybody could stop him." End of quote. The bullet struck Dolly in the stomach. She died a few days later. No one was arrested. Informal justice was pursued. But because of blood and marital ties between the families, nothing was resolved. When asked about the Sheriff's Department's role in investigating Dolly's murder, Vernita remarked that she thought 
there had been a report filed, but nobody really expected the law to do anything. It's interesting to note that Vernita Voiles is the granddaughter of Elizabeth Johnson and the sister-in-law of Dolly Voiles. She was also my beloved grandmother. Alvin Flowers, who was born and raised in Sandy Gap, shared a story with me about his half-brother Frank, who was born in 1925. Frank's mother had four children, but by the time the three youngest were old enough to remember interacting with Frank, he was grown and living on his own, albeit in the next holler over. Frank was well-mannered when he was sober, but he could be a demon when he was drunk. The same could be said for most of his boyhood friends who remained in the mountain community. One night in 1960, Frank, who had not been drinking, arrived at his mother's home with his new bride, Mary. Frank's teenage cousin, Dorothy, was there with her older husband, John Walker. John was using profanity in front of the women, so Frank told him to stop. The men exchanged heated words. Finally, Frank accused John of mistreating Dorothy, and a fight followed. Frank's larger size gave him an advantage over John, and he got the best of his cousin-in-law. Well, a few months later, all the trouble was behind the longtime friends. Some men in the community, including Frank and a man named Leonard Klontz, went over to John Walker's for a Sunday afternoon of whiskey drinking and storytelling. Too bad there were no NFL games back then. John and Leonard began to argue, and it soon turned into a fight. John was losing the fight, so Frank pulled Leonard away. Out in the yard, Leonard pummeled Frank with a small ham gun. Frank used his size and strength to hurl Leonard around the yard. Despite his initial advantage, Frank let him go, and some of the men urged Leonard to go home and cool off. Leonard got into his car, and since it was warm weather, he took time to roll the window down. Frank, who had by now decided not to let Leonard go home, ran to his scared friend's car, which was slowly backing out of the dirt driveway. When he reached the vehicle, Frank tried to hit Leonard through the open window. Leonard, still shaking with fear and holding his 22 caliber pistol, raised it and aimed it at Frank's right temple. With a trembling hand, he fired it into Frank's defenseless head, causing him to slump to the ground. Though the shooting was investigated, Leonard didn't serve a prison sentence. Surprisingly, Frank didn't die from his wounds. Because the bullet, which had never, never been removed, traveled through his brain, he struggled for the rest of his life with paralysis. In the wake of the incident, Frank's thirst for alcohol, alcohol increased while his desire for human companionship, including his interest in women, fell off the chart. Two years later, in 1962, Frank's body was found with a bullet hole through the chest. Because his rifle lay next to him beside a note that said, I've never been successful, but maybe this will be a success. The Cherokee County Sheriff's Department decided that Frank's death was the result of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Soon after, Leonard Klontz met up with Frank's best friend, Henry, and a fight over Frank ensued. Dodson beat Leonard severely. When he recovered, Leonard stalked and killed Dodson. He served an 18-year prison sentence for the murder. Leonard's time in prison did little to cause him to avoid trouble. A short while after his release from prison, Leonard visited a friend named Roy Rich. Despite being old friends, a quarrel developed between the two men. Roy, Roy pulled out a gun and shot Leonard, ending his tortured life. In the case of Sandy Gap, the incidents described were not the result of drug or whiskey deals gone sour. They began as domestic disputes and evolved into acts of retribution for perceived wrongdoings. Clearly, in the small North Carolina mountain community of Sandy Gap, Celtic justice was practiced as late as the 20th century. These accounts of violence paint something of a negative portrait of Appalachia. As negative as they might seem, the incidents are true and deserve an explanation. Still, many people in the Upland South, Appalachian and the Ozarks, are quite loving and will give of themselves at the first hint that help is needed, whether asked or not, even if the person needing help is an outsider. Tennessee is called the Volunteer State for a good reason. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's show and will like, share, and subscribe to the channel. I look forward to seeing you again here on The Vantage Point. God bless you and yours. Bye-bye.